several key spirit science episodes were demonetized for strange reasons. Along with the last conspiracy video, our Hollow Earth episode was flagged for hate speech, and Everything is Connected was deemed unfit for most audiences and age restricted. Please use the link below to join Spirit Conspiracies and access this content free just in case it disappears from the public eye. The subject of extraterrestrials has mystified humanity for countless generations. The question of, are we alone in the universe, has inspired us to push forward and advance as a species in the search for life in the great beyond. But to this day, judging by the way people generally treat the subject, it would appear that we have yet to make any form of substantial contact. Yet, the awareness of a deeper truth that something is being hidden from us is regularly being leaked to this day. Let's start with some basics, which would be UFOs, which we all know stands for Unidentified Flying Objects, or as they're starting to be called today, UAVs, Unidentified Aerial Vehicles. It was shortly after the two atomic bombs went off during World War II that UFO sightings spiked around the world. Hundreds of reports of UFOs began to emerge in the decade that followed the incident, and it was in 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico, that things got really interesting. Reports of a UFO crash landing in the shape of a flying disc inspired tremendous interest in possible alien activity as the US military quickly quarantined and cleaned up the site, claiming it was simply a weather balloon. This was really the beginning, and today, thanks to modern technology, especially cell phones, we have access to thousands, if not tens of thousands of seemingly unexplainable UFO sightings from around the world. My own personal favorite is the Dome of the Rock incident from 2011, where several independent people caught footage of a bright glowing and oscillating orb that descended over the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. After hovering over the sacred temple for several moments, it shot upwards with tremendous speed, disappearing into the sky. In more recent times, a video that was leaked several years ago was released by none other than the Pentagon, featuring three separate accounts of US military pilots attempting to track and follow incredibly fast moving aerial ships without any clue as to what they were. Along with curious phenomena like these, we also have a long list of ex-military officials who have either claimed to have seen or even had some level of interaction with these crafts identifying that not only are they real, but they have no idea what they are. One particular interesting subject in this discussion is the work of Robert Dean, a retired command sergeant major, who after that job became a ufologist and had been very public about his experiences with UFOs and ETs up until his passing away in 2018. At one point, he gave a presentation, the full thing of which you can find available on YouTube accounting many of the things that he saw in the military and NASA. The most interesting of which being the story of what happened during the real moon landing. Now, many people today believe that the moon landing itself is a conspiracy, that it was faked because of certain things that stand out about the moon landing that don't make sense, such as why the crosshairs of a camera are appearing behind a particular object on the screen, or the strange objects in the reflection of the astronaut's visor. But what Robert Dean has described was that there was actually a real moon landing. But what happened was that upon arriving at the moon, what the astronauts found was that it was populated. There were, according to him, little alien people walking all over the place, ships flying through the, well, I'd call it air, but I guess they don't have oxygen up there, do they? This was such a shock to the astronauts that after their visit, they returned back with 40 rolls of film of what they saw, 
and NASA supposedly destroyed it. The thinking seems to be that the revelation of this truth was so out there that NASA buried the truth because of what would happen to the world if this was to get out. Now, I'm not saying that I'm in support of hiding the truth, but at the same time, think of how many religious beliefs would be shattered from this truth. How much chaos would be caused if all of a sudden, our entire global paradigm was to change in an instant. Again, I'm not saying that they're destroying the footage if it did happen was a good thing, but at the very least, trying to see things from every perspective. Specifically, there was an ex-CIA operative who spoke with AJ Plus at one point, and she described that the single most important thing that she learned from her time as basically a spy was that everyone believes they are the good guy. So even if this event did happen, whoever it is at NASA who controlled all of the information probably did it believing they were doing the right thing. We will return to Robert Dean at another point soon because he shared something else that was very interesting. However, first we have to discuss this. You may be familiar with a man named Bob Lazar, one of, if not the first, to come forward with inside leaks about the secret government UFO programs. He claimed to have been hired in the late 1980s to reverse engineer purported extraterrestrial technology at what he described was a secret site called S4, a site similar to, and rather close to, Area 51. He described that he had access to a recovered UFO ship and for several years was attempting to discover the secrets of how it worked. Lazar claimed that the propulsion of the studied vehicle was fueled by the chemical element with the atomic number 115, known today as Moscovium, or E-115, which at the time was named Unampentium, since it hadn't been created yet. However, it was first synthesized in 2003 by a joint team of Russian and American scientists for real. He said that the propulsion system relied on a stable isotope of E-115, which supposedly generated a gravity wave after being excited by Livermorium, element 116, during proton bombardment. He argued that the decay products brought about by the reaction between the two elements would include gravitons, a hypothetical quantum particle that is thought to be responsible for gravity. In his new Netflix documentary, he used the analogy that the craft is kind of like a bowling ball. If you were to put a ball onto a piece of fabric or your bed sheet, and then proceeded to push down on the areas around it, the bowling ball would fall forward into the bends and gaps that you create around it. In this way, the craft would kind of just fall through space by distorting space-time around it, like in a continuous rolling motion. This is what allowed the vehicle to fly and to evade visual detection by bending light around it. He said it levitated silently, and when it was activated, he was unable to even put his hand on it because the force would repel his hand away like a strong gravitational field. According to intel that he received while at S4, the ship, which was one of nine that the military had access to, was originally from the twin binary star system called Zeta Reticuli, and had belonged to the Greys, which are the most common visual of aliens that we generally see today when you think of what an alien might look like. We even have an emoji for it. He also explained that the way that the military worked was so secretive that they wouldn't even let the various divisions studying the craft to communicate with each other, so progress on reverse engineering the technology was very slow. While one group would be working on controls, another on propulsion, and another on, well, you get the picture. But due to this isolation, they wouldn't easily be able to identify how the different parts of the ship were interconnected and worked together, and thus reverse engineering became very difficult. This was especially challenging because supposedly the ship was entirely interconnected. There weren't really any moving parts. It seemed to be one singular solid object. The seat and floor and panels and walls were all one singular material with no sharp edges anywhere, an entirely different kind of machine than anything we're used to today. Now, after Lazar came out publicly about this, his life fell apart Many people quickly looked into his life and found that he seemingly never had any of the education degrees that he claimed to have had. Yet, upon deeper investigation, documents stored away in his old university proved that he was telling the truth. Bob explained that after he came out publicly, he received a phone call from his ex-employers who said, do you have any idea what we're going to do to you now that you've done this? And for many years, 
Bob suffered as much of his past was erased and he was made to look like a fool in front of the masses. Now, Bob's story is a very interesting one. My highest recommendation is checking out the documentary he created with Jeremy Corbell called Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers, as well as the Joe Rogan podcast that they appeared on, where Bob goes deep into the story of what happened and what he learned. But Bob isn't the only one to come forward with some fascinating stories. And this brings us to Dr. Stephen Greer, who founded the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence or CSETI in 1990 to create a diplomatic and research-based initiative to contact extraterrestrial civilizations, along with the Disclosure Project in 1993, a research project devoted to disclosing to the public information that the government and military supposedly have had regarding the existence of UFOs and ETs. The organization claims to have over 3,000 confirmed reports of UFO sightings by pilots and over 4,000 proofs of what they describe as landing traces, evidence of UFOs landing on the Earth and leaving behind a sort of electromagnetic signature. If we pair this with what Bob Lazar said, it's entirely possible these ships could be bending light, entirely invisible to us, though perhaps not high-level military scanners. Dr. Greer also appeared on the Joe Rogan podcast many years ago and explained some very interesting things what he received from a collection of over 30 documents from the NRO, NSA, CIA, FBI, and presidential briefings was that the way that these ships work and the way these ETs understand the universe is leagues beyond our own. What he described was that while today we believe that light is the fastest thing in the universe, this is only a barrier. And on the other side of the speed of light are laws that are governed by some sort of super consciousness and that it is from this higher awareness that interdimensional travel becomes possible and you can move throughout the universe nearly instantaneously without worrying about the speed of light, which is simply too slow to travel at if you're going from solar system to solar system or especially across the galaxy or even between galaxies. This is incredibly important to us because it's relative to the idea that consciousness and conscious thought actively steers the field of reality that creates the experiences that we have. This is a subject we will return to shortly. However, this conversation has one massive implication. You see, one thing that Dr. Greer explained was that the significance of alien life to us isn't really all about ETs at all, but about technology. The very instant that it became available would completely transform life on Earth forever. Imagine suddenly being able to travel to distant planets or explore the universe and forget about having power to fuel the entire world's energy requirements forever. You'd have enough power to blow up a planet if you wanted to. This has tremendous implications to it and may even be part of the reasoning for keeping the technology hidden for now. The question arises, is this technology hidden so that only the secret rulers of the world can have it? Or is it because humanity is not yet ready to inherit such a gift? One final piece in the ET and UFO conspiracy is the concept of the hoaxed alien attack. This comes from the late Dr. Werner von Braun, the top Nazi scientist of Hitler's army, who after World War II came to the United States to work for the US government. Funny how that happens. And on his deathbed, he theorized that after a war with the Middle East, one day there would be a hoaxed alien attack, which was a part of the secret plan to weaponize space and control the world. He actually urged Dr. Rosen, his secretary, to thwart this plan above all else, because if it were to come to pass and space was weaponized, whoever controlled these powers would have complete and supreme control over everyone, and the world would fall under the complete control of the oppressors. Now, the subject of ETs does not end there, however, because there is also the reptilian conspiracy most famously brought to the public attention by the British conspiracy theorist David Icke, it's become one of the most infamous and popular conspiracy theories ever, sparking numerous parodies and commentaries in the media and TV shows. To put it simply, Icke believes that an interdimensional race of reptilian entities known as Archons have hijacked the Earth and are stopping humanity from realizing our true potential. He has argued that these Archons are the same beings mentioned in many Gnostic texts that have identified themselves as demons and rulers of the seven planets in various traditions. 
mostly having the ultimate goal of preventing souls from leaving the material realm. He claims that because of this, they have gone by many names throughout history, including the Anunnaki from Sumerian myth and the Watchers and Nephilim from the Book of Enoch. He argues that human sacrifice to the gods in the ancient world was actually for the reptilian's benefit, especially the sacrifice of children, because he tells us that at the moment of death by sacrifice, a form of adrenaline surges through the body, accumulating at the base of the brain and is apparently more potent in children, something that is today reminiscent of adrenochrome. Bringing it more into the modern day, he claims that a genetically modified human archon hybrid race of shape-shifting reptilians known as the Babylonian Brotherhood or the Illuminati or Freemasons to us today manipulate global events to keep humans in constant fear so that the archons can feed off of the negative energy that this creates. Now, he has also claimed that the members of this secret elite are descended from reptilians coming from the Draco constellation. He stated that the reptilians come not only from another planet, but also another dimension, the lower level of the fourth dimension, which he calls the astral plane, the one nearest to the physical world. As of 2003, when his books originally brought this theory out, he said that the reptilian bloodlines include all American presidents, three British and two Canadian prime ministers, several Sumerian kings and Egyptian pharaohs, and a whole bunch of celebrities. Remember when that article went viral about how Justin Bieber supposedly turned into a giant reptile in front of everyone? Some of the most prominent bloodlines are said to include the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, various wealthy European families, and established families of the Eastern United States, and the British royal family. In fact, he said in numerous interviews that he saw former British Prime Minister Ted Heath's eyes turn entirely jet black while the two men waited for a Sky News interview in 1989. Ultimately, the global elite make up the top of the pyramid for the reptilians in modern day, all with the intention to keep us sedated and trapped in this reality without gaining a higher knowledge. At the top of the global elite are what Ike has referred to as the prison wardens who oversee us in what is, to them, just a prison world. Along with the New World Order, their main goal is apparently to create a microchipped population, a one world government, and a global Orwellian fascist state, a brave new world, which he claims will be a post-truth era where freedom of speech is denied. And how are they planning to do this, you might ask? Well, if Ike is to be believed, then the Brotherhood either created or controls everything. Things like the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, Roundtable, the Council on Foreign Relations, Chatham House, the Club of Rome, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderberg Group, as well as the media, military, CIA, MI6, Mossad, scientific publications, most religious doctrine, and even the internet. In other words, they control every aspect of our society and can make us believe what they want, when they want. Before we move on, I think it's important that we now revisit Bob Dean and a particularly interesting story that he shared during the European Exopolitics Summit in 2009. He described that he was attending his son's retirement ceremony from the US Navy in Washington, DC. And at this event, there were a great deal of active and retired generals, admirals, captains, and more. One particular retired Navy scientist approached him and said, hey, I know you. You're that retired command sergeant major who has opened up about the UFOs. I have a story for you, that my last government job was as a plasma fusion physicist at a top secret place outside of Las Vegas. And I was working there for five years with two guys who were not from here. They were from somewhere else, delightful people supporting us in figuring out plasma fusion, which equates to infinite energy forever. The man said, after a few years of working with these guys, I approached one of them and asked, okay, what do you really think of us, humans as a species? And the alien said, well, since you've asked, we think you are a primitive, savage, and dangerous race. The other alien who was listening in then leaned in and said, and you also smell bad. And he explained that it's not really about our bodies, 
although yes, we have polluted our bodies and the earth to a wild extent, but that we also have a psychic odor about us. Our thoughts and feelings are so negative that other higher species find it terribly offensive. While this story is actually kind of funny, it's also something that we should take very seriously. According to the reports and expressions from many whistleblowers, the other species who are interacting with us are actually mostly benevolent. And if we can really listen to what they have to say and do some meaningful self-reflection, it may just help us to clear out our own negativity, release ourselves from any reptilian or other controlling influences and put us into a position to meet some really cool otherworldly species.